And there's your, see, there's your frame, yeah? OK? All right. All your belongings are going in this bag. Survival kit? Yeah, that goes in your pocket, OK? That's got to be in your pocket all the time. Right. So we've got something to eat, Pete. This is the good stuff, yeah? Yeah. You can break us up something like so. Yeah, I spent all my life in a tropical rainforest, like, you know, like um, Malaya, uh, Borneo, the Amazon, you know, uh, in Africa, the Abadez, you know. I'm a home in the trees. It supplies everything you need. It's full of life. And in the Far East, it rained every day or once a day in the dry season. It rained all day in the wet season, you know. Water sustains life. So there's never a shortage of water. So straight away, you're on a winner. Water promotes life, so all your wildlife, insects, animals. And so the jungle flourishes, you know. And once you get used to it, uh, it's, it's your ally. You know, it supplies everything you need. Um, so out of all the environments, um, the desert, very nice and that, but very hard going. And the harshest places in the world to survive are the extremes, like the cold areas of the world, you know, um, the Arctic, Antarctic, and anywhere altitude above 7,000 feet, you need specialist skills. If I make a mistake in the jungle, maybe cut myself or get sunburned, that's one thing. Make a mistake in the Arctic or a cold climate, I lose fingers, a limb even, or my life, you know. And so we're not meant, man is a tropical animal. We can only survive where we're born in the tropics. The moment I leave that environment, I've got to provide a tropical environment, i.e. clothing. There's no heat in the clothing. My body produces the heat and between the layers dictates how warm I am. Whereas if I go to, like say, Alaska, um, I've got to have all the clothing. I've got to provide that environment. And without it, life expectancy is minimal. Okay, we start from the bottom and we start building it all the way across and then overlapping until we've covered the frame. We must ensure we put lots of this on to keep out the rain. Now we've ensured there's no holes in it and it's thick enough to repel any rain. As soon as COVID started, I, I thought, okay, dig for victory, I'm in survival mode. I didn't plant any flowers. All my flower beds were full of onions, carrots, spuds, and all the window boxes, and I dug for victory. And we didn't go out, we didn't chop, uh, we isolated ourselves, men and missus, and we, there wasn't a weed in the garden. It was immaculate, you know, because we spent all that time out there. We had nothing else to do. And, uh, and on power cuts, we take it so much for granted. And we're going back years now, the last time, like, we experienced a power cut in Hereford here, and we all sat around, oh, what should we do? And the kids said, put the telly on. You can't, there's a power cut. Okay, put the radio on. You can't, there's no electricity. And we finish up with candles, which they love, but they've got torches out, and in the dark they're playing hide-and-seek and games, and, and it really excited them, you know what I mean? You know, it was... But we take things for granted, like running water and that. And I say, um, just be prepared. Uh, I've got a pond in the garden, so it's, it's a few thousand gallons of water, you know. Water is so essential to survival, you know, and I've got a supply. I mean, it's good water, but it's still boil it, but... And it attracts everything. You know, we've got fish in there, which is a source of food, obviously. But ducks come and visit. All wildlife guns, including squirrels and that. So as a survival um, standby, you know, being prepared, it's an excellent uh, thing. And I tell people, if you can, have a pond. If you have a fire in the house, fire brigade can just drop a hose in without looking up for a hydrant and that, put the pond, fight the fire, you know. And again, um, we have a year's supply of food in, all canned goods, some dry goods like flour, pasta, stuff like this, honey, but all tins like, you know, and um, you're reaching at last year's prices. As long as you turn things over, as you use them, you know, and if you look at a tin of beans, what you bought last year, they probably say 15 pence. This year, they're 20 pence, you know, so by having all this in the garage or anywhere convenient, in a, I wouldn't say in a loft like because of the weight, but in the cellar, you know, turn it over regularly. You're never out of food. And when the tools go down or supermarkets shut or whatever, there's no supply in the, in the shops. 
you, you got a good standby, you got food. So you got food and water, you got your shelter, your house, um, you, you're surviving, you know. And so it's just good, it's good practice. You know, I'm, I'm not doom and gloom saying there's going to be a, a, you know, a war on that, but it's being prepared. And we always say, what could possibly happen? Have got a contingency plan? And that's what we try and do, you know, anticipation. It's better than cure, you know what I mean? Um, see all these dangers, all these threats, do something about it and say, if this happened, can I deal with it? So, again, it's just little things, nothing sort of um, outlandish. Have a supply of water, have a supply of food. Okay, see on this root block? Just scrape it off. Yeah. And rub that across your teeth. It's a discalent. It contains um, a chemical that's ideal for taking plaque off your teeth, yeah? Oh, wow. I know all my kids with us when I was running my survival school, and they learned, you know, everything I could teach them, you know, and they still remember it. All the Latin names of the all the fun guy used to teach, you know. And it is like, and um, they could have taken interest in it, mine, but I tell people, you know, get kids away from their computers out, get them outside and just introduce them to nature. They'll never ever be bored. If you can tell them what the tree is, what you can use it for, all the animal signs and that, it's endless, you know what I mean? And it's healthy. And what they learn at an early age, they'll never forget. And now schools, they're doing these outdoor schools in woodlands and that. Kids who struggle in the classroom with maths, English, whatever, take them outside, different environment, and they're more um, receptive. And, they, and they, they shine at the subjects that they can't do in the classroom, you know, and it's all down to environment. And remember, one time we used to live outdoors, and so we knew when the sun set, what the moon was doing, all the nature, how things grew and that. And now we live indoors, unless we still connect with the outdoors, we forget all these skills, you know, our sense of smell. I talk about awareness, you know, we use all our senses, eyes and hearing, but the sense of smell is so important, especially in the jungle, we can smell things. And the locals, so highly developed, if you cut a tree, they can smell the sap, you know. And we've all got this um, ability, but we, we lose it unless we practice it. So, uh, I tell get your kids outdoors. This is a pole bed, built on an A-frame. It's very strong, and the more weight you put on it, the stronger it becomes. Now, this is ideal when you've got bad ground conditions, such as you find in the jungle with creepy crawlies and ants and termites. It gets you off the ground. TV is chewing gum for the eyes, you know what I mean? It's all sorts of rubbish. Get them outside, never be bored, you know, and you introduce them to it. Wet their appetite and they start researching themselves and they're asking questions and I think you've got them on a winner then. Food, fire, food, fire, shelter, water, navigation and medical. And to put them in priority, this is where we try to hammer it like, put, put them in perspective and priority, we use the acronym PLAN. P for protection, L for location, A for acquisition, N for navigation. Protection is first like If he's in the desert and you had two points of water and a blanket, everyone would go for the water, whereas they wouldn't survive under the sun without shelter. Whereas the blanket, put it up, you know, make shade with it, and you can expect up to three days survival time without water with no long-lasting ill effects. So it's getting it in, into perspective. And no matter where you are in the world, the Arctic, the desert, the jungle, the sea, it's always the same, protection, location, acquisition, navigation. Once you've got a good hot fire going, then we start feeding on the main fuel. Now, don't bother to cut these, just end feed them on and arrange them like a star. This way, they would catch. The fire's burning merrily. We can do all our cooking. We can boil our water. As the fire dies down and we don't need to cook, we just separate these slightly. And this way, we're going to conserve our fuel. I, I always try and bring credit to the regiment, Chris. You know, I won't divulge secrets, uh, secrets any any skill, operational skills or things like that, you know. And um, I owe the regiment a lot. That's where I learned all my skills. And I try and bring, like, credit to the regiment. Um, <sighs> and I put it. Um, and I'm trying to get a, like you say, when I wrote my book, I wanted to call it, you know, whatever, survival, but they said it's got to have essays in the title. 
And uh, I said, I don't want that. And the, and the publisher said, look, are you ashamed? So I thought about this. I said, no, I'm very proud. He said, stand up and be counted. So that's what I did. Well, cock that one up then. Yeah.